Here's the thing about perspective, and if you're watching uh, the news sometimes and you're seeing somebody that you disagree with and your first instinct is to argue with them, before you argue with them, try to get their perspective. Try, try to get an inverted perspective. That's called empathy. And so one way, Jonathan, you were texting me yesterday about reading the Bible and, and preaching and all of this, and, and I was trying to show him some things. And when you, when you take Jehoash as a villain, and, 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 and Jehoash is a lazy man, and, and you, don't, you don't stop to think about what's happening here, in that how many times have you stopped because it didn't make sense? The reason I believe he stopped is because arrows are supposed to go like this. What sense does it make to put an arrow in the ground? And I want to point this out to you. I'm having fun, man. I love what I do. I do what I love. And, um, and to do this with something that's supposed to do this, it's hard to be persistent when you can't see the purpose. That's all I'm trying to say. And I guess what I wanted to tell you, Daniel son, <laughs> is that Mr. Miyagi isn't always going to explain to you why you're painting his fence. That he's not always going to tell you why you're waxing his car. And I know that you would paint the fence if you knew the purpose of painting the fence. And I know that you would wax the car if you knew the purpose of waxing the car. And I know that you would stay a virgin if God would give you your wedding date. See, Jehoash had a calling. And Elisha enrolled him in a class. Write this down. Don't expect the class to look like the calling. Don't expect your training. Don't expect your don't expect your preparation to look like your promise. Because the place God prepares you the most is the place that seems the most pointless to you. I laugh when people talk about Elevation Church being a marketing phenomenon. I laugh because, in a sense, they're, they're correct. Who lights a lamp and puts it under a bowl? And put it on the stand, give light to everybody in the house. I didn't get the gospel to keep it to myself. I didn't start a church so I could get 120 people, send everybody else to hell, bolt the doors, and everybody sing Kumbaya while the ships come sailing by. So, in a sense, you're right. We want to get the word out. But it takes me back to my preparation. Now, to understand why Elisha was angry, you would have to understand something about his process. You, you, you really can't understand someone's priorities without knowing their process. So I didn't start marketing the church with a budget. I started marketing in ministry, if you want to call it marketing, printing out flyers. Because Jamie Williams gave me his code to the copying machine at First Baptist Church and let me run off 300. He said, no more than 300, but I gave them out every Monday to FCA at Berkeley High School. I was marketing with a copier code. I was marketing on the summer impact team. When I say work your window, when I say even if it's a peephole right now, if you work your copier code, maybe one day God will give you a billboard. Come on, somebody. I know what I'm talking about from my personal experience. It's not a theory or a principle or a philosophy. It is my personal experience that if you are faithful in little, he'll make you faithful in much. Why would he waste more if you're not working what you have now? So we we traveled to this small little town in South Carolina. I don't remember if it was Camden. I think it was Camden, where we were supposed to hold a youth rally. Holly can tell you we were on a, a summer impact team, a ministry team that uh, crisscrossed the state of South Carolina, hosting backyard Bible clubs and uh, revivals, and and uh, we were so excited about our theme that we had developed called Run to Win. 
and I had a theme, and I had a team, and I put Holly on my team because I liked her, and I figured if I can get her in this van with me for 11 weeks, she will get attracted to my anointing, and I worked my window all the way to my wedding day. I'm just preaching what I practiced. Now look at me, y'all. We went to our first stop. I'm so excited. Run to win. The youth is our first stop. We're going all summer. It's an 11-week ministry uh, extravaganza across the state of South Carolina. And the youth pastor said, well, I got some good news when we got there. I said, cool, man. He said, no kids signed up. I said, how is that good news? He said, oh, you can chill by the pool this week. Take a little break. I said, bro, it's my first week. I don't need a tan. I need some kids. Am I lying, Holly, that we hit the streets so hard? Was it Camden? Am I getting the town wrong? I don't remember, but we canvassed that town. We can, let's call it Camden. We canvassed Camden. I mean, flyers on every door. By the last night of the crusade, we had it at 40 kids. You ain't clapping because you don't think that's big. 40's big when you thought you were going to be by the pool at the Motel 6 all week in Camden. And I know what you're thinking. What's the point? That's exactly what I was thinking. It's called ground game. It's called preparation. Why would God have let me pastor thousands if I wasn't willing to hit the streets for 40? And, and I wish I knew. I, I could preach so much better if I knew what God's got you doing right now that seems kind of pointless. I would have stopped too. I don't even know if I would have put two or three arrows in the ground. It doesn't make sense to strike the ground with something that's supposed to fly in the air. It doesn't make sense to declare victory with an instrument of death called a cross. It doesn't make sense to kill a giant with a slingshot with the most inexperienced one on the battlefield doing the slinging. It doesn't make sense to deliver a nation with a stick in your hand. It doesn't make sense. God prepares you to trust the teacher by putting you in a class that does not look like the calling. Lions and bears don't look like Goliath, but they are the perfect preparation. Now I've come to the point in my life where I'm learning to trust my teacher to know that even if this doesn't look like it, everything is preparation. And I mean everything. Every fence I paint, every car I wax, every offense. Is preparation. Maybe this won't take your pain away, but if you would start seeing your pain as preparation, I'm not saying God's the one who hurt you. I'm saying in His hands, whatever hurt you will become healing for where He's taking you. I'm prophesying to somebody, I don't know who you are. But God is preparing you. He's getting you ready. You're in the field. You're tending sheep. God is preparing you for what he has prepared for you. It's not failure. It's preparation. It doesn't feel like preparation. It feels like failure. But the failure was preparation so that I would have the infrastructure and the fortitude for the success. God's got me in the garage right now. The garage doesn't look like the racetrack. But God's not done. He hadn't hit post yet. All things work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. He's preparing me. Yeah. The point. The point is for you to trust a teacher. That's the point. Take the arrow, strike the ground. And I spent all week trying to figure out something. I was preparing this week. I wanted to come to the pulpit prepared. 
and I knew that there would be at least one person paying attention who would want to know, why would Elisha get so angry over something so simple? Well, first of all, he was about 110 years old. I don't imagine there's much to be happy about at that age. You'd be crotchety, too. So that's number one. But for my second clue, I wanted to give you point number three, the plow. Because I figured there would probably be something about Elisha's process that would help me understand his insistence on perseverance. He, he could not believe what he saw. He could not believe that someone would have an arrow of victory in their hand but refuse to do what needed to be done to secure the victory. And so I went back through his life and just remembered a few things. This is one of my favorite Bible characters. He was the subject of my book that uh, I wrote called Greater. So me and him spent a lot of time together. And I saw him one time. These kings needed rain. They needed provision from heaven. And Elisha told him, okay, you want rain? Dig some ditches. But see, now it wasn't raining yet, so they didn't need an irrigation system. But Elisha knew that the key to receiving provision is to make preparation before you can perceive it. So he told him to dig some ditches. The first thing that he did when he took the mantle from Elijah, the one who left him in transition, the first thing that he did was to heal some water in a town called Jericho, some water that had become toxic, and to revive the economy, he needed to heal the water supply. And so he asked for some salt. Salt comes out of the ground. Of course, we know this. It comes either from the ocean or it comes from the mines, but either way, it's manufactured by pressure. I could preach about the power of pressure, too, I guess, if I wanted to. See, because it looks like pressure, but it's really preparation. Think of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Gethsemane means olive press. It was the pressure of the garden, so great that it was like drops of blood. When he sweat, it was like drops of blood. I don't know if he burst the capillary or if it was like that metaphorically or literally. Either way, he was under pressure. His pressure was his preparation. Quit asking God to take the stress away. Start asking him to show you how to handle it. <laughs> Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. He made a precision. It's the power of pre. It's the power of preparation. It's the power of taking salt and throwing it in the water, and the water was purified. And I was noticing how Elisha wasn't afraid to get his hands dirty, which took me all the way back to the first time I saw him in Scripture, because Elijah had kind of had a little meltdown, and he threw a little hissy fit. God doesn't need you to be perfect. God doesn't need you to make perfect, be perfect. He just needs you to keep making progress. And when Elisha went back, God said, all right, now I've got, I've, I have made preparations for your successor. Elijah was so tired. He didn't know what to do next. Jezebel wanted to kill him, and he didn't have a backup plan, but God did. And God said, if you get back going the way you came, I've got, I've got your succession plan already in place, and I'll show it to you when you get back in position. Elisha is walking. I had him pull this one scripture for you. Because it was so profound when it hit me, and I understood at once why Elisha was angry when the king would not strike the ground. It's in 1 Kings 19:19. 19, 19. I want you to look at this. It says that Elijah went from there, the place where he was making excuses, feeling sorry for himself. He went from there, the place of pressure, the threat of Jezebel, the anxiety of the future. He went from there on the word of the Lord and found Elisha. Please read with me, because what I'm going to show you next is going to explain to you why the season that you're in doesn't feel significant, but it is so important that you do it with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. He found Elisha, son of Shaphat, and Elisha was preaching. Now, remember, his calling was to be a prophet, but sometimes the classroom doesn't look like the calling. He wasn't prophesying. He was 
plowing. He was digging up hard ground. He was not, not only was he plowing, but he was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the 12th pair. What do you think the view's like? When you're last in line. And at first I couldn't figure out why Elijah didn't go to the prophet school. Why if God if God was preparing somebody to take up the mantle of Elijah, wouldn't he get him from the, the prophet school? But he didn't want somebody who knew how to preach. He wanted somebody who knew how to plow. Because if you're willing to plow, I can teach you to preach. But I need somebody who's not with, not scared, not backing up, not going to get tired and turn back. He who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. I need somebody who knows how to plow. And we have a generation that knows how to post but doesn't know how to plow. Hey, thank you for watching. Make sure you subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream. And share this video with a friend. And don't forget, you can join me live every Sunday. Thanks again for watching.